Good afternoon, everyone. Today is the Feast of the Transfiguration of our Lord. What a beautiful feast that we celebrate today. You've heard of the Transfiguration, right, of our Lord on Mount Tabor, where our Lord takes Peter, James, and John up a high, lofty mountain and is transfigured before them. Well, I just want to tell you, uh, I had a funeral today and I went to Washington Crossing for the burial in Newtown. So it was, uh, it was a distance. So I'm sorry that I'm a little late with this. Uh, you know, following me will be Deacon Don Nichols and Linda Nichols with their evening prayer and a little bit of catechesis. So uh, you have them both, but you could always view this a little later or uh, pray with Deacon Don and Linda evening prayer. So whatever you decide, we just want to make sure that we, you know, send you some love and, you know, give you uh, some spiritual goodness here. <laughs> so I apologize that we're late because of the funeral and the burial at such a distance, but it was a beautiful funeral mass. The family were so appreciative, like all of our people are. We just have a wonderful parish. It's just they're lovely, lovely people. So I extend my prayers to Barbara and her family as uh, she buries her husband, Joe, today. God bless you, Barbara. Well, anyway, I'm talking about the transfiguration of our Lord up Mount Tabor. Now, I'm gonna to talk to you about a couple of things. It's interesting about mountains and how God uses mountains. And the second thing I wanna to talk to you about is Peter, James, and John. Why were they singled out to see the Lord transfigured? How about the other apostles? Why not them? Okay, let's talk about mountains. What is a mountain in biblical theology? Well, a mountain is an encounter with God. It's a, it's a beautiful encounter in which God speaks to his people about a serious plan for you and me. For instance, Mount Sinai, that God spoke to Moses, gave him the Ten Commandments. How often do the prophets go on the mountain to speak to God? And the, the mountain is high, and it, and it, and it gives us a, a whole aroma, I guess, of the spiritual, because it's high up to the heavens. So all the prophets, how about our Lord on the Sermon on the Mount? the Beatitudes, how beautiful these teachings are of Jesus. Mount Tabor, the Lord is transfigured. Mount Calvary, he dies on the cross for our salvation. So mountains are a place of encounter with God. It's so beautiful that when we look at scriptures and we see the mountains, and we understand even the people of Christ's day and before him understood mountains as beautiful places which people encountered God. Well, you and I encounter God in so many places. I was telling the people at Mass today that I call that sanctuary in our church, you know, the, the place where the altar is, the tabernacle, the priest chair, and the ambo. I call that area the upper room, don't I always? Because that's where the Last Supper took place, right? And also the place where Pentecost happened. So you'll hear me often say the upper room. Well, today I said to them, you can also say, here's Mount Tabor. Here's the mountain, the mountain of God. Did you know by any chance that, <clears throat> you know the pulpit, where the priest preaches from and the readings are proclaimed from. We call that an ambo, A-M-B-O, A-M-B-O, an ambo. Many people would call it a pulpit or a podium, right? Well, do you know in some churches they have these pulpits that go high up? And there's steps that goes up to the pulpit and the priest sees all the people there. Do you ever notice in the cathedral, the ambo is very large and it's up a 
that staircase. I, I've been in that pulpit. It's beautiful. It's warm up there, but it's beautiful. Why do they build them that way? It's like the mountain. The mountain in which God spoke. See, we hear God's word right in the scriptures. Doesn't it make sense? That that's the mountain in which God communicates his plan for us. And there it happens. You take those steps up to the mountain of the pulpit or the mountain of the ambo and proclaim God's efficacious word. But anyway, Jesus takes them up Mount Tabor. Mount Tabor. And he's transfigured before Peter, James, and John. Why? Well, scriptures theologians tell us that they were very much afraid of death and the horrific death of Jesus. They understood what a crucifixion really is like. I guess you and I could never understand it as much as a, a I would think, a, a, a follower of Jesus. I'm thinking of the term, but I'm, I'm drawing a blank right now. But thinking, could you imagine a first century Jew? How's that? Thank you, Holy Spirit. Uh, a first century Jew. They, they, would, they would understand that because Jesus died in 33 AD, didn't he? 33 AD. And so a first century Jew, how, uh, how they witnessed these horrific crucifixions. Well, Peter, James, and John, I think it was too, too much. Remember when Peter said, God forbid if this should happen to you, Lord. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You're not judging by God's standards, but by man's. The Son of God has come to take the sins of all away. He is the sacrificial animal. Remember they used to sacrifice all the animals and all that for the sin offerings of the people? You've heard all those Old Testament uh, stories from the Hebrew scriptures. Well, Jesus is the lamb sacrificed. That's why he's called the lamb of God, right? Don't we call him that? Jesus, you are the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's right. Because you embody all the sins of humanity. All the sins of humanity. From day one to the present day into the future. You take away the sins of the world. You are the lamb of God that slaughtered on the altar of the cross. How beautiful. How salvific. How life-giving for us. Well, they were afraid of all that. So Jesus says, come with me. Takes them up a high, lofty mountain and is transfigured right before their eyes. So could you imagine what Jesus looked like when he was transfigured before them? They, the scripture says his clothes became dazzling white. His face was illuminated, bright, shining light. You ever notice that we have halos around saints? You know that, the ray of light? You, you've seen halos, haven't you? You know, sometimes they're like circles, circles of light above the head. It's the light, the eternal light. So when you think of a halo, remember the transfiguration, that illumination of God's light upon. So the, the, it does not end with death. It doesn't end with death. I said that to the people at the funeral today. It doesn't end with death. How beautiful it is that life continues to go on in Christ Jesus. And so there it is. Jesus tells Peter, James, and John, it doesn't end with death. But who comes on the scene? Moses and Elijah. Now, what is the significance about Moses and Elijah? Well, Moses represents what? The law. Remember Mount Sinai? The law. 
and Elijah, the mountain, the prophets. Isn't it beautiful how this is all interwoven and it gives credence that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. And it's solidified for them who the person of Jesus was and is. It gives him credence. Because you have to remember in those days, the law and the prophets were it. They were the spokesperson for God. Now it's Jesus, in the God in the flesh. And so now they appear. And it's interesting, what does Peter say? See, Peter, not James or John. Again, I want to tell you something. Peter speaks up. Again, he's the head of the apostles. I don't know if you picked that up. Like, why didn't, why, why didn't James talk? Why didn't, like, John say anything? No. Peter's the head. Peter's the first pope. Peter is the head of the band of apostles, the group of apostles. He speaks. Lord, it's so good that we're here. Let me set up three booths, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. You know, to pitch the tent on the holy mountain of God. Let's stay here. Let's stay here because they felt content. They felt at peace. Again, Peter's like, I don't want you to go through that crucifixion. Let's just call it quits now. And let's just stay here. No, because I'm not, I'm not doing what I've came to do. I, I've come to say, set this world free from sin. I have... We have to go down, Peter. We can't stay here. We have to go. And then what happens next? The heavens are rent open and the voice of the Father is heard. This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. Wow. Unbelievable. When was, when was that voice heard before? at the beginning of the public ministry. Remember when John baptized Jesus at the River Jordan and the Spirit descended upon our Lord's head and the heavens were rent open and the voice of the Father was heard. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Credence from the Father the beginning of the public ministry and the coming of the close of the public ministry. Again, what does that say? How beautiful the credence of God bestowing his message on the mountain about all of this, about what this is his will, about what life is, and what eternal life is, and what the plan was. The law, the prophets, fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. Absolutely beautiful. And all because they were afraid about the scandal of the cross. Because who was put on the cross? Criminals, people who were not one with God. Oh no, this is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. How beautiful the Feast of the Transfiguration is. It helps us to increase our faith and to surrender to God so that God can transform us, transfigure us. You know, what about now, though? Because at the end, you and I believe that we will be transfigured. Body and soul, a glorified body, right? But what about now? Well, I'm glad you asked. 
every time when you and I receive the sacraments, we're transfigured. There is a change that happens to the soul. When a newborn baby is coming to the font, his soul is one way, tainted with original sin. After he has received the sacrament, his soul is changed. Absolutely changed. A new creation, an heir to the kingdom, a child of God. Confession. You come into the confession one way. You leave. Your soul is changed. I told you that even in churches, the confessionals and the baptismal font were really by the entrance. Well, I don't know what they do today. Some of them have the baptismal font up at the front on the side altar. I know like that. Theologically, I don't like that. I know everyone could see, it's all nice, it's up front. It pops the balloon of the theological mystery. Because penance is a second baptism. And baptism is the doorway into the life of Christ. I always tell people, when you leave the confessional, go over to the baptismal font and touch it. Remind yourself that you have received the second baptism. Touch the font. You're born again. Every time you go to confession, you are born again. Why? Because your soul is cleansed from sin. In baptism, you're born again because your soul is cleansed from original sin. Penance is a second baptism, perpetually. It's important to know that the soul is transfigured. When you receive Holy Communion, I said the same thing. Confirmation, the same thing. Holy Matrimony, the same thing. Absent Holy Orders, anointing of the sick. You know all of this, don't you? Absolutely. It's good to be reminded of this transfiguration, that all of us are transfigured in Christ and we die and rise with him in every sacrament. It's good to be reminded of all these things. It's good for me to remind myself because when I preach to you, I preach to myself. I'm in need of salvation as well as you, right? And I need to be reminded of the truth of the gospel, the truth of Jesus Christ, the truth of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church in which we all belong. So today the church celebrates the feast of the transfiguration when Jesus took Peter, James, and John up a high lofty mountain, was transfigured for them, and there was Moses and Elijah, and the Father's voice was heard. All so that everyone could understand that Christ's death on the cross does not end that way. We are transfigured and we will receive a glorified body. But let's do continue the work of redemption now. We have these many transfigurations. So I was at Mass this morning I received Holy Communion. I was transfigured. Is that neat? I was on retreat last week. I went to confession. Yay! I was transfigured. It was beautiful. Oh, I forgot to tell you, we were on retreat. We had 45 priests on retreat at St. Charles Seminary. Isn't that beautiful? Three bishops were there, Archbishop Perez, Bishop Senior, and Bishop Delaman. They were all there. 
we had it at our seminary, our beautiful seminary, St. Charles Borromeo. It was wonderful. Father Fred Miller was the retreat master. And he really talked about the mystery and the gift of the priesthood. And talked about John Vianney. John Vianney, the patron saint of parish priest. So it was wonderful. And we were renewed and transfigured. We were renewed and transfigured. Praise be God. Well, everyone, I want you just to think about this feast. I want you to think about that mountain. I was on that mountain of Tabor when I went to the Holy Land. I went into the church and I just, they had beautiful paintings of the wall of Jesus. And then on one side they had Moses and Elijah. Isn't that beautiful? I love when churches do paintings that are theologically based. Not just paintings. Like, is there a meaning behind it? Like, what's the meaning? Do you ever go in our church of St. Mary's, those who are not parishioners? On either side, we have a mural of the Annunciation, and then on the other side, the Coronation. It's the Alpha and the Omega of Mary, the beginning and the end of Mary. The Annunciation, and of course, the Coronation into Heaven. It's good to see these things in glass and in paintings because it helps our faith. Remember I told you about the letter that Pope John Paul II wrote for artists? Did you have a chance to read that letter? Please do, Google it. Read the letter that John Paul II wrote for artists. The beauty of God in art and how there's a whole theology and a catechism in art. That's how people learn their faith, especially at a time when people were illiterate. They looked at windows. They looked at paintings. The story was told. Isn't it the same thing with like people like coming to Mass, I, I always have a smile on my face on Christmas Eve when I celebrate Mass and after Mass, I see parents take their little ones up to the creche and explain all the figures in the creche. Jesus, Mary, Joseph, the shepherds, the kings, the angel, the star. Beautiful. Remember that nursery rhyme? Mary had a little lamb. Hello. Christmas. Mary did have a little lamb. And his fleece was white as snow. That lamb was sacrificed for us on the cross. Oh, Mary did have a little lamb. And that lamb gave us salvation. May you and I understand our faith little by little each day. Hold close to it. But more importantly, share it with our family, our children, and our grandchildren. So that what Jesus has started may continue all throughout eternity. Don't you decide what you want to believe. Jesus has already laid out everything. Everything's done. He wants us to enter into the mystery. Too many times we don't want to enter into the mystery. Enter into the mystery. How beautiful that is. Well, let's continue to pray for one another. Tomorrow I'll probably talk to you a little bit about divorce and annulment because I want to pick up from that because I think it's important to talk about that, especially if you have of a person or a friend that want to know some information about that. Okay? 
Happy Transfiguration Day, everybody. Have a nice day.